Welcome to another episode of Code for Thought. The research software engineering community is reaching regions and countries around the globe, including, of course, Asia. Meet Saranjit Kao and Jyoti Bogal, both co-founders of the RC Asia Group. In my discussion with Saranjit and Jyoti, they take us through the work they have been doing to build an RC community from scratch, and not just in India. Both have reached out to people from other countries such as, for instance, Pakistan and Japan. But before we go into the interview, I have an important announcement to make. Because the registration and the bursary are now open for the forthcoming RZ conference in the UK. And this year it will be held in Swansea between the 5th and the 7th of September. And now you can register for it as well. And here now my conversation with Saranjit and Jyoti. Hello, Jyoti, and hello, Saranjit. Welcome to the show. It's very exciting to have you on board. You are members of the RSE Asia group and community, and that's exactly what we want to talk about today. But before we go into it, maybe you can introduce yourself quickly. Hi, all. Uh, I'm Jyoti Bhogal. I'm based out of India. Uh, I have my uh, studies in uh, statistics and uh, later on I uh, got into software development and I got to know about uh, the field of research software engineering via a conference. And since then I uh, joined hands with Saranjit in uh, starting work on RSE. Hello everyone. My name is Saranjit Kaur. Uh, I am a statistician by training and I'm also based in India. I have been involved in a number of communities of practice like Our Ladies and for, for quite a few years now. And I'm a strong advocate of open source, open science. And RSC Asia is uh, something that uh, like this idea emerged when I attended USAR in 2021. And there's a good long story behind how we build this organization. And I'm uh, very excited to share it with you all and uh, the learnings that we got on our way. Where about in India are you? Because I understand that you're actually in two separate locations. I'm based out of uh, a place uh, in Maharashtra. It's a small town called Ahmednagar. It's in a uh, western part of India. Yes, yeah, so I am based in northern part of India. I currently live in Gurgaon, which is a part of the like very close to the national capital of India. Right, because this is the first time we actually have um, somebody from India in this podcast. So I'm very excited about this. Saranjit, you and I met actually in Newcastle at the RSE conference in 2022 in September, uh, where you presented a poster, RSE Asia, celebrating its first anniversary. I'm interested in finding out how did it all start? You already alluded to the fact that it might be a longer story, so let's get started. This was when I was attending USAR in 2021, and there was this keynote speaker who was talking about research software engineering. So that was the first time that I heard that terminology, 2021. It was a scheduled talk. I did not know anything about this uh, being a whole community in the UK and how it is flourishing there. From what uh, what I felt about that keynote is, uh, I can relate to what this person is talking about, but I don't see any community nearby me because I have been involved in communities. So that stuck to my mind that there are no RSC communities around me mm -hmm. anywhere in my state, in my city, country. Uh, uh, th there was no mention of RSC. So whatever she the, the keynote was speaking about who RSC is and what kind of work they do, that was very relatable. But then uh, I did not see any face whom I could reach out from my own <laughs> local region. That keynote really motivated me. I messaged uh, someone from that same conference that how can I connect to the UK RSC group. So I got to know that apparently they have a Slack and there are many people there. There are like groups that are established in different parts of the world or they are emerging. So I started that conversation like how I can create one in my region. Uh, that is where I started the conversation. And soon after that, I got to know that there is this program called Open Life Science. And it was like very less time left to put in a proposal. <laughs> I did not know whether 
community building proposal would ever get ex- accepted i was not aware of this fact like, i was really fortunate that mm-hmm. i got entry to open life science with this project and that is where uh, things uh, started and got more structure jyoti what was your route into rse in asia so i too had participated in usar conference in 2021 and i i got to know about this uh, keynote i heard it and later on uh, sanjit came up with this idea uh, she wanted to write this proposal so, so she wrote the proposal to open life science about building community i just agreed to volunteer in it i like specifically remember how jyoti got involved was the open life science program uh, we had like i got selected for cohort 4 in that selection email they i think it was the selection email or somewhere like very close to the start they did mention that if you want to get mm. someone else on your project who you think would be helpful or who wants to contribute you're welcome to bring them on even if they did not apply in the first place so this was a very uh, <laughs> you know an opportunity to bring jyoti in get some uh, help with the project from the very start so so she has been then uh, there since cohort 4 with me i think we might want to explain that a little bit to the listeners what open life science is and what these different cohorts mean could you explain that to me how open life science has helped you building these projects first i'll give a brief idea of what open life science is essentially it is a training and mentorship program uh, for 16 weeks you don't have to dedicate full time to that work but if you have any uh, side projects uh, that you are really enthusiastic about and you want to build them using open source open science principles specifically you can apply to the mentorship program you get a period of 16 weeks where they are it is systematically you are taught how to build a good decent open science work what are the parts that would make it useful for the community and then you also get a dedicated mentor who is checking with you throughout the journey share whatever you are learning and if you're feeling stuck somewhere you can talk to your mentor and somewhere in between every cohort there is also opportunity to invite experts they have created a pool of experts and mentors you can invite someone from the expert pool that OLS have or you can mm-hmm. use the network and try to reach out to someone who you would not get a chance to reach out to otherwise if you were not a part of this program that is how it is structured and it is not very hectic to schedule it within your day to day life uh, it's quite easy on that end they do provide some accessibility benefits if you require anything on that for example you require some hardware so there are some grants associated small grants but again those are also very helpful for some people and quite motivating jyoti what is your uh, experience and with open life science the entire community the organization uh, called open life science uh, they are really very supportive and the entire uh, mentorship program the best part about it was that it's very structured they conduct regular calls in the entire duration of 4 months for one week there is a call with mentor and uh, alternate week there is cohort call so it keeps alternating and then we can have regular sessions with our uh, mentors also in the cohort calls with the community important principles are taught important technical skills are taught and uh, that uh, helps a lot so the cohort are in the sense that the mentorship program runs for a specific period of time and once that is finished a new cohort starts so it's basically a group of people for a particular period of time how many mentors did you have one mentor uh, for one project and overall uh, there was a group of uh, other mentors as well in the common calls there were uh, four other people as well rse asia is obviously starting from scratch sort of a year ago thinking back or looking back over that year what do you think you accomplished in the last 12 months when we first wrote this proposal uh, it was cohort 4 of open life science and we had one mentor and then immediately after that cohort jyoti continued with cohort like she applied for cohort 5 and she had one more mentor then 
the two cohorts almost covered the first year that we were we had launched there was a lot of learning so i have been involved in community building previously as well but uh, this time it was way more structured i had someone with to bounce off my ideas i had jyoti i had my mentor we also conducted a hackathon on our launch day so that mm-hmm. was in 2021 and then we conducted a hackathon again in 2022 so we uh, were essentially participating in hacktober fest in both the years and this year the hacktober fest like 2022 that we participated we had arranged contributing hours uh, for one hour uh, ev- on every weekday of the month of october it was open to all the community amongst ourselves amongst me jyoti and the newly formed working group which i will share about them we were doing a lot of infrastructure building we were updating our website introducing new pages to the website someone is writing blog someone wants to update the co- code of conduct so like we did all these kind of activities uh, we can call it low code contributions this time because that was the theme for hacktober fest this year so last year the launch we had that it itself was uh, via ols4 open life science cohort 4 and along with that uh, hacktober fest so in last year's hacktober fest 2 mainly uh, we both were working on setting up the all the digital infrastructure and uh, along with that uh, we had advertised on uh, twitter few people had joined back then uh you mentioned that you had previous experience with community building could you touch on that maybe what kind of experiences do you have you mentioned our ladies yes our ladies was really instrumental so i i started a local chapter of our ladies in india in pune a few years back like when the events used to be in person pre pandemic <laughs> that was a university based setup i had like i got a lot of support with getting a classroom or where we could conduct events for the community definitely all of that experience helped me to understand what could go right and what doesn't go so right while doing work for the community so one thing that i learned is that especially with this kind of community engagement and building uh, work if you don't get enough support and if you are trying to build something which is not existing in that region like people are first of all not aware of that term or the importance of that community sooner or later you will turn out of all fuel and you might feel discouraged uh, in the long run it is not a very easy path to walk on what i had learned is that i need to speak to people who have already walked on this path before and that is why open life science was our mentors like over there the interactions were really really helpful and to this date we continue to be associated with open life science we reach out to them for any question that we don't understand or whenever we are feeling lost about what are the next steps that we should take and it only develops when you have interacted with people for a significant amount of time so that isolation of working just for community and not really getting a solution of how to progress or how to take it further that was something that i felt that i need to improve on that aspect when i was writing the rsc asia proposal ols really helped with like acting like a sound board for us so something that i the a learning that i took from my previous experiences to this one what about you jyoti When Saranjit had started this chapter uh, in Pune for Our Ladies Pune, initially I used to be a participant, and uh, we had seen that when there were physical events, and because it was a university, we used to get a lot of participation. However, we had started conducting those events around uh, October or November in two thousand and nineteen. soon there was a pandemic in 2020 and we had to discontinue those events we tried to have some uh, online events as well um, but there was not as much as a response as we had received earlier continuing that uh, was becoming difficult and then uh, when we joined ols we got a mentor having a mentor is what was the bigger change that is what helped us sustain the community 
Ann Foylox was our mentor and we used to have meetings with her uh, every alternate uh, week. And for almost all the problems, she used to give some of the other solution either by herself or uh, she used to uh, tell us about uh, some other person uh, who could help out, uh, help us out with that particular problem. It's quite a challenge, actually, because, I mean, you mentioned the pandemic and, as you say, face-to-face meetings have the advantage that you get a better connection with people, particularly if you've never met them before. RSE Asia has grown all the same, despite of it. And it's now going beyond India. So how many countries have you got representatives from at the moment? Because it's quite a big group now, isn't it? Uh, when we started, it was me and Jyoti, and we had men- mentors supporting us. Uh, so Jyoti was uh, participating in Cohort 5, and her uh, project was on building pathways to on- onboard new people to RSC Asia. During her project, she collaborated with her mentor and started a plan to create a working group. We both stay as the co-founders. During her project, we launched a call for proposals for volunteers to join the working group. And we encouraged them to uh, join from different parts of Asia. So I'll hand it over to Jyoti. Like how After cohort four of Open Life Science, we participated in cohort five, which started in February 2022. There were two objectives. One was to get our uh, organization registered and other was to have a working group. So for that, we made an advertisement on Twitter and uh, got our responses from there. Uh, People did show interest in joining with us. Now we have a community with representatives from Japan, Bangladesh, Nepal, Pakistan uh, and India. That's a huge area, isn't it? (laughs) I mean, India... Uh, the country itself is massive. So I just want to mention, I don't think we have anybody from Nepal. Like we did try to reach out to a few people, but we, we did not get any representation from there. Like we have from Japan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, India. There was someone who joined from Hong Kong, but then they are leaving to elsewhere for some work opportunity. Mm. And then we also created a code of conduct team. Besides the both of us, there are six more people in the working group who are supporting from different parts of Asia. There's still a lot of region left to be covered, but we try to increase the visibility of RSC Asia in different parts. Uh, Actually, for uh, most uh, community work, it happens that sometimes the role gets a little vague or sometimes a person is interested for some time and then later on they might be interested in some other opportunity. We design the pathways such that whenever a person joins the community, we have different roles within the community. They can be a national representative, they can be in the code of conduct team. And then in that role, they can continue for one year. After that, if they uh, feel they are interested in the same role, they can continue further. If they feel interested in some other role, then they can work on that. Uh, So this way, it would keep them uh, active as well. I would like to move on to the role of research software engineers itself. There's quite a wide range of what it actually means. In the UK, for instance, and in other countries, not just the UK, There are actually specific roles called research software engineers. In other countries, however, it's a little bit more vague and there are no specific roles for RSEs, but people who identify as such. So what is the situation like in India? To be honest, I have not come across the term RSE. Like I was not aware of of it unless I attended USA 2021. So I was not aware that this profession exists and maybe it exists in industry or people are doing that work but they don't know that they can be called a RSC. Postdoctoral positions here are sometimes called research associates. Like they are the people who are very close to what a RSC should would be doing. From what I am aware of, I don't know of many opportunities which are published and promoted as a a research software engineer role. I would also not be confident in saying that the definition of research software engineer is very clear in our region. Is that how you got into it, that you were research associates and uh, that was the route for you in order to get into 
uh, software engineering? Not really. I don't call myself a research software engineer in my work. Like mm-hmm. I don't have that job title yet or that kind of profile. It is uh, quite a tricky, tricky situation. How I got into it was that I felt relatable to the role of what a research software engineer is. I come from a statistics background. I have written code. I review people's work. I read different kind of research papers from different domains and I try to provide solutions. This is something that what a research software engineer can possibly do, but it is not my uh, work title or it is not something which I can find easily in my region. Jyoti, what is your experience in that respect? The definition of RSE is a bit uh, vague even now. I came into it due to my uh, previous experience in software development and my studies of statistics and the work that I have been doing on uh, clinical trials. Also because of my interest in community building. India, of course, is one of the powerhouses of software engineering. How hard is it? then to attract people into science and develop software solutions for academic institutions or research centers? There is definitely a lot of potential when it comes to this role in India. But again, people are not aware of what they are doing can be called as research software engineering. It is not advertised and it is not looked up to. Like, I don't have an immediate answer. It is going to take time. Uh, Like, it took quite some time for it to develop in the UK. For this terminology to spread across the masses who might be interested in this kind of job profile or work profile, it it will take some time and it will take some work. I know of any immediate academic institute which is offering a, like, which has a RSC team and they have these people helping others as permanent roles in their institution and they're helping different research groups. Although there is a lot of potential, that is true, but it is not recognized and people don't realize that they are actually doing that work. And also looking at software and research as a primary product is itself a <laughs> paradigm shift that needs to happen. Mm-hmm. Calling that a research product and giving the same importance to a RSC as they would give to a researcher. This mindset, this change of thought process uh, will take some time and work. It will indeed, and not just in India. So I think we're struggling still here in the UK with it. Shorty, you, you wanted to add something? There are a lot of people who are very skilled in uh, developing software. And people are at the same time, they go through papers, research papers, but This role itself is called as the work of an RSC. So it's not a well-defined term yet. Then I guess the main task for you guys is to raise awareness and actually create a a language where people can talk about RSEs or research software engineering as at least a role, maybe even positions in future. We're coming towards the end now, uh, and I wanted to ask Now that you've got a year behind you, and that's a lot of work, what is your plan for the next year and beyond? You rightly pointed out the first task that we have in hand is creating awareness. Next actions for over a year or so are engaging the community, conducting events that people find useful. Like recently we had a workshop which taught about how to put our text uh, in scientific articles. The plan is to conduct such events regularly. We have got a fellowship from the Society of RSC and now we have an independent Zoom account uh, where we can host such events. We use that account to conduct Hacktoberfest in 2022. So it was a month-long contributing our series and we tried to promote it as much on Twitter as we could. There is also a maintenance cost associated with it. We are doing this as volunteer work in our free time. We don't want to burden ourselves too much with too many platforms. So we are restricting to just one (laughs) platform for spreading awareness about this role. We have a working group and we are also encouraging them to promote the RSC uh, events that we are planning in into their regions as well so that we get more and more participation. 
there is definitely a curiosity among people who join our events about what what is rsc asia doing what is this term the responses during the events are also really uplifting we might be committing some mix mistakes we might be missing a few things but we are learning in the process and our immediate plans are to continue this these kind of events in more regular fashion maybe have some invited talks or from experts so that is the short term plan in terms of long term plan we seek to develop a proper governance and also more formal structure of how things would work in rsc asia also mentioned about the registration so she did a lot of research about it uh, like we are not planning to register immediately but yes we are reading a lot about how it can be done and what are the requirements for it um, uh, what kind of events are you talking about are you talking about workshops interactive workshops or is it uh, more in a lecture style than hands on uh, workshops yeah i would really prefer the workshop pattern shorter workshops where uh, people get to learn a new skill or at least they are made aware of some skill that other experts have the altext workshop that i was talking about we got a really nice two speakers who are working on how the blogs that are published and then they really taught us systematically of how to write all text for graphs because scientific blogs and scientific reports in- include so many graphs and they are not very screen screen reader friendly they taught us the how to not write too much in the all text but also not li- write too less so that was one of the event and then we started planning for the hacktober fest and the hacktober fest was about more about infrastructure building and updating our presence on the web for the events in the future we are reaching out to a few experts and organizations that we know who would help with workshop like a short workshop style event where uh, people get to participate and also learn something new and engage more with the community then the hack tower is that going to be a regular event in our so, asia for the past two years like in 2021 we started like we launched with hacktober mm. fest so it was there and then in 2022 it was back again in the month of october we decided like why not go for it we also have a zoom account now so we don't have to depend on anybody else to provide a account and where we can invite people so that has really made our life easy to conduct these kind of events having that account and having the society of rsc to support us can i just ask a very practical question how useful did you find platforms like twitter in community building it's the primary mode of communication and it has helped us since the launch the launch we had announced over twitter when we completed ols 4 cohort we announced it over there we, uh, cohort 5 we announced it over there when we wanted to create the community the working group the advertisement we had given on twitter and we got replies from there and for each tweet we get a good engagement it makes us feel more motivated we are not promoting twitter for <laughs> no, it's not an advertisement i understand but we have that kind of community and audience already there that has helped yeah okay Well, thank you very much, uh, Sanjeet and Jyoti, for your time today. And I wish you all the best for the future. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having us here and discuss our journey uh, in so much details. We are really happy to share about how the Open Life Science Organization helped us to form a structure. If anybody is struggling to build a community in their region, we are happy to talk to them if someone wants to reach out. so they can find you on twitter and they can find you on a website which we will share yes. in the episode notes yes okay thank you very much oh time's up see you next time but before i forget this podcast is covered by the creative commons license see ya